Yeah, well. <laughs> Next time. <clears throat> Okay. Okay, so uh, I'm Tom Glenn. I'm visiting from uh, New York, and uh, I'm just coming up from Kalamazoo. I'm doing the show at Western Michigan University, Paul Plain site. And uh, the curatorial criteria of the show has kind of grown out of my uh, interest in minimally determined form and the generic. So. Um, I basically, basically, I'll just read this paper, but I did have this uh, part of this talk was designed for uh, the student audience down at Western Michigan University, and I was asked to give a little bit of a genesis of my thinking and my experience. So I'll just I'll run through those slides really quick, and I'll, then I'll read the paper. Uh, so this is, an, this is a, an installation shot of the show that's currently up now. The show is up until... Uh, February 4th, you get a chance to go down to Kalamazoo. <clears throat> so this Robert Morris, this is a Robert Morris installation, and Robert Morris is one of my uh, teachers at Hunter College, although by the time I got to Hunter College, I wasn't necessarily influenceable uh, by, by his, his uh, format, but Nevertheless, you know, when you think of minimally determined form, you can't help but think of minimalism as a historically canonical, uh, you know, period. And I, I was showing this to students as an example of a prehistory of a thought of generic form. But one of my interests in, in the generic is to kind of reposition the whole idea of minimal, minimal form into um, a, a different format outside of a kind of a canonical uh, art historical uh, period, and just to re re reinvestigate uh, minimal form. <clears throat> so one of my early influences was also this kind of presentation. This is group material. I was in this show actually. It's in 1990 at Dia Art Foundation. My installation was on the other wall, which I can't find any uh, photos of. But this is also uh, kind of like a minimal, it's not necessarily minimal, it's kind of a maximal uh, installation, but the way that Group Material installed their shows was kind of, in a way, channeling minimalism in their kind of, their installation uh, aesthetics, uh, which was kind of, more based on a kind of phenomenal sculptural uh, installation. And this is, you know, when I was involved in that show, it's the first time I met uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres and Doug Ashford. And Doug Ashford is actually in the show in Kalamazoo because I maintained a relationship with him since that time. Uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres has since passed away, but in talking with him about his his influences, he said unequivocally, the minimalists were a strong influence on him. Donald Judd, Carl Andre, and he's an interesting example of somebody who, um, you know, took that canonical heritage and did something completely different with it and, and reinvested it with. Uh, subjective histories and pathos. So I you know I was showing this as kind of a an elaboration of the minimally determined, but not necessarily uh, not necessarily having the imperative of re retaining the historical heritage. This is David Hammonds, also an artist who I met in New York back in the mid 80s. And uh, this is an installation that he did in a gallery in uptown Manhattan also influenced by uh, kind of like a minimally determined uh, presentation. Now, not all of his work is like that. A lot of his work is over-determined in, in the sense that it it's, uses a lot of political imagery. This show was different for Hammonds because he was not using any imagery, uh, or the imagery was so minimal. 
So it was interesting. It was kind of a very transgressive show for him because it wasn't what people were expecting of him. <clears throat> so again, I, I was just showing a few of these slides just as kind of like a genesis of my thinking and my experience in the art world, thinking about presentational strategies and also thinking about the generic and the minimal outside of the uh, art historical period uh, minimalism. This is a, a collaborative group in New York called the Bruce High Quality Foundation. And uh, they're collective and they do, they derive a lot of their material from quotidian uh, kind of off the shelf, ready-made uh, materials, but they also have these, they do also have these kind of sculptural a sculptural quality to their installation that does relate to some degree back to minimalism. <clears throat> so, you know, if you think of minimalism in terms of like platonic form or, or reductive, uh, uh, you know, aspects of just like reductive to gestalt, people like Felix Gonzalez Torres and to some degree Bruce High Quality Foundation are kind of reinvestigating that whole idea and positioning it outside of a, uh, maybe a reductive and a platonic uh, form, which is something that I'm interested in. And this is one of my photographs that I have a photography practice that um, kind of an everyday uh, practice of these generic photographs. So this is just a, an image in Brooklyn that I took of a storm door that had this kind of like an Ellsworth Kelly painting, painted on the inside. Um, so, so part of what my practice is, is to incorporate a kind of a, a non-decisional, generic, uh, just glancing uh, in the phot photographs in particular. This is a photograph I actually took in, in um, Kalamazoo uh, of just like another kind of a generic uh, situation, uh, and here is also another another photograph I took in Kalamazoo of uh, it's kind of very generic kind of mailboxes. This is a, a a recent painting of mine. I'm also a painter. Besides taking photographs, the, the photographs are, are they're kind of like a sketchbook in my thinking, so, but they've become another practice just almost by default. And these are some paintings that were recently installed in a show that I was in in Berlin in, in, uh, in, in December. The, the format of these particular pieces was derived from uh, what happens when you first open a Google search and there's no images. So the generic template of these particular pieces is derived from a digital source, but since then, these pieces are called survey, so these things are just kind of a generic template that I've just used as uh, a way to present uh, minimal form, but also have the, the half-life of their source somehow uh, informing their uh, their sense of uh, aesthetics. <clears throat> now getting to the show, um, so that's just the introduction. So let me just read from this uh, this paper that I had prepared for uh, for the lecture for the show. Plain sight is comprised of a group of contemporary emerging and established artists from New York City whose individual aesthetics share a generic effect. More specifically, these artists share a presentational mode that is minimally determined in both abstract and figurative ways, yet each artist's works are suffused with specific and not necessarily homogeneous intents. Plain sight hopes to make manifest the unmediating potential of the generic impulse, the interruption of the representational conundrum of hypermediation or the overdetermined representations of contemporary image culture in order to unlock the radically imminent potential of the more plainly seen. So the title Plain Sight comes from this concept of presenting the minimally determined in somewhat in opposition to our overdetermined mediating culture. 
Recent translations of the French philosopher Francois Laruelle's work have brought his ideas to a more prominent place in contemporary aesthetic thought. His non-philosophical method and essays in non-photography and non-standard aesthetics are all directed at what he considers a non-decisional threshold in philosophy and art. The implications of Laruelle's thoughts is underdetermined and generic basis for considering ontology and aesthetics has a potentially liberating effect on category-bound definitions of art, such as the dialectical oppositions between abstraction and representation. So, you know, when you think about minimalism in, say, like an opposition to abstract expressionism, reductive form versus, you know, expressive uh, form based on the body, Generic aesthetics in, in the terms that I was, I'm, I'm interested in uh, just suspends that whole dialectical argument. It's not even an issue. This idea of the generic mode of operation and perhaps a more, is, and perhaps a more naturalized way of experiencing the world as unpredictable causal phenomenon within a normative functionality is not limited to continental theory, but is also evident in the thought of such American pragmatic thinkers as Wilfred Sellers and his idea of picturing and the manifest image, which seems intended as generic substitution for the ideal and the real of Platonic philosophy. So Sellers is somebody who uh, grew up in Ann Arbor, so Mich Michigan, Michigan guy. But uh, I wanted to, in this sense, instance, like balance the continental philosophy with American pragmatist philosophy because I thought it was important in my own thinking because it's not just determined by French philosophy, uh, French or continental philosophy, but it's also I'm coming at it from also uh, a Sellers and also to some extent Rorty uh, tradition. <clears throat> But I'm using Sellers here in this idea of this manifest image because uh, I'm working with imagery. And uh, so Sellers' theories, however, vehemently eschew any uh, given ideal relations between thought and the world in the classical sense of deriving significance from uncovering truths behind illusionistic masks. He empirically sets up a parallel dimension for the causal and the normative functions of language that allows for an autonomous rea reality of each so that the arguments for illusion and truth and a consensual ethic of reasonable communication can be examined for their, at their own face value, rather than as a metaphysical given. To some degree, uh, Laruelle and Seller's theory of the generic and the manifest image reach a point where the dialectic of truth and illusion collapses into a more radically imminent and pragmatically expressive way of, of picturing and being in the world. So to some extent, my, my curatorial criteria in the show is to kind of explore how those, how the generic and the manifest image collapse into a radical imminence and how that can be uh, an expressive way of picturing and being in the world, a pragmatically expressive way of being in the world. Plain Sight uh, presents an array of artists naturally working through the non-representational communicative potential of the generic and idios idiosyncratic ways. Um, I just said this, but my curatorial criteria for the show is not intended to offer yet another formal category of reductive logic to squeeze aesthetics narrowly into or out of, but rather to interrupt the closed circuit of dialectical reason and its reliance on representational thinking for a more open-ended discussion of contemporary art and aesthetics. So now I'll talk about the specific pieces. This is a Doug Ashford piece, a member of uh, one of the early members, charter members of uh, group material along with Felix Gonzalez Torres, Tim Rollins, and uh, Julie Alt. Uh, this is, uh, now he's interesting, uh, his more recent work is exploring uh, abstraction, so that's why I thought it was interesting to include him in the show, because he's somebody who comes out of um, kind of like a socially engaged practice, but he's currently really interested in uh, exploring abstraction and how abstraction could be integrated into his history of working with uh, socially engaged practice. So, so he applies the language of generic form and color arrays in conjunction with socially charged literal and figurative backgrounds and specifically in the events of September 11th, 2001 in this next day series of prints which were accepted for, accepted for the exhibition. 
uh, Ashford's research into William Warringer's idea of abstract abstraction and empathy he has expressed in his own words. If empathy is the stabilizing embrace of oneself in another, abstraction is a resolution to experience ourselves in concert with the instability of the world, unstable, experimental, and provisional. This intent towards an open-ended inquiry repositions the traditional narrative of abstraction, of abstraction as reductive, perhaps as a purifying process, into a more complex position of a state of experiment, experiential flux which admits life rather than withdraws from it. Joe Fife, another artist in the show, uh, let's see, has, has also admitted all kinds of found materials into his practice to arrive at such graceful compositions as Malfeda here which is a painting that's kind of made from found materials, even though it looks like a very formalist abstraction, it's made from these found materials uh, stretched on a, on a canvas stretcher. His work refutes the reductivist abstraction model for one of an aleatory and inclusive beauty. Um, another work in the show by the artist Ivan Balin. Uh, Ivan Balin's work has also has its feet planted abstractly in the common in such works as unfinished drawings and three wooden boards, which I don't have a picture of. Balin's work differs in process from Fife's in that they are synthetically fabricated casts of found material. So these, these pieces are actually uh, polyurethane castings. They, they present as paintings or drawings, but they're actually cast as, uh, so there's an aspect of simulacra to them. Uh, as well, this is an aspect I wanted to kind of touch on in my curatorial criteria. <clears throat> His works differ in process and style from Feist in that they are synthetically fabricated casts of found materials rather than barely presented, yet the two artists share a spirit of generic aesthetics in their use of under underdetermined found forms. In a related way, this prints and sculptural work of Aaron Gemmel seem preoccupied in works with trace elements of the analog breakdown of digital fabrication, uh, with the trace elements of an analog breakdown of digital fabrication. His floor piece, which is, this is a, an excerpt from planned surface changes, is comprised of a scattering of multicolored laser cut plexiglass elements, which has the feel of industrial cast-offs or the otherwise overlooked byproduct of digital computation. His fabricated forms seem to address the concept of the co coincidentally left over rather than the intentional distillate of the abstract. <clears throat> One of Gemmel's uh, colleagues, Matthew Schrader, utilizes industrial materials as a reference in both their prefabricated origin and ultimately their use in his works as Transcendentally Empirical Studies of Phenomenal Weights and Measures. His untitled is comprised of rubber steel, um, rubber, these are, this piece is comprised of a rubber gasket for an ocean liner uh, window. So it's like this massive, like, you know, if you can imagine an ocean liner window is this massive, but it's a section of a, a rubber gasket for an ocean liner window. But these are presented somewhat like minimalist uh, Gestalts. So what, what you have here with Schrader's work is you have this kind of like section of an industrial, uh, uh, a, a section of uh, a piece of an industrial uh, artifact, a little bit similar to say like how somebody like Eva Hess would use those as materials, but like significantly different in the, in the sense that it's not really mediated at all. It's just, it's just a section of a gasket. So the his work is interesting, like Gemmels, and in his his work is probably the, the least mediated of all the artists in the show. <clears throat> um, the artist Carrie Yamaoka similarly uses plainly industrial materials with the intention towards a more quiescent perhaps phenomena, phenomenology of form and content. Her work, such as this painting, which is also a layering of uh, acrylic 
uh, resins. Uh, if you, if you see the work, it's it's got a a paper underneath it, but it's the layering of acrylic resins has actually a thickness, um, which has a quiescent uh, feeling of say like um, an Agnes Martin or something, but it, it's kind of resistant to a kind of a pastoral reading. Uh, so at first you, you, you approach these pieces monochromatically and they seem mute, yet with interaction yields subtle expressions of undersaturated color and a certain haptic awareness. An abstract sense of touch is invited in Yamaoka's work, which translates pre previously perceived reductive form into a kind of biokinetic realism. <clears throat> so when I was talking with her at her studio about her work, she was very much involved in how the viewer had to spend time in front of her work and had to, how the work had a relationship to the viewer's body and how that was kind of like a biokinetic realism. <clears throat> That's my words. That's not her. Those aren't her words. So. Jacob Cassé, uh, the Jacob Cassé works in the exhibition like Venn by Necessity and Less relate in one sense to the serene contemplative aspects of Yamaoka work, Yamaoka's works, yet in their indeterminately cut out and monochromatically and monochromatic forms engage one's peripheral consciousness in an uncanny fashion. While these works may seem to merely, merely incidental in their inconclusive form, they are quite persistent in their mereness and therefore profoundly physically present in their abstraction. Um, I, invite, I invited a, a group of artists, a group of younger artists, a millennial aged artists to um, participate in the show. It's kind of like a show within a show. Um, because I was interested in this generation's relationship to mediated uh, awareness and mediated consciousness. And a lot of these artists, uh, like uh, Tai Yin Ho, Alex Lombard, and Libby Rothfeld, uh, tended to cleave more towards the ready made and more towards the kind of the abject. And I think there was a relationship uh, in choosing these works to include that kind of a dialogue in opposition to like an over-mediated culture and because you know that generation has a different relationship to media mediated culture than i would so i, I wanted to invite um, these artists who are associated with sorry archive and sorry archive is um, claire marocha and uh, vanessa phil who were like the these sub sub curators curators within the show so i had them choose works based on the premise of the show. <clears throat> and to some extent, they play with uh, contingent authorship. And I, what I wanted to do by including them in the show was to make my own decisional threshold uh, more contingent. So I was, even though I had the final word in including their, their section of the show, I pretty much like let them have free reign in terms of what they included based on my general, general curatorial criteria. <clears throat> so the artists, most of the artists in plain sight in, in uh, the Sari archive section manipulate generic materials, incorporating the abject humor of commodity detritus, rife with narrative and haunted by lived experiences. Everyday, exper everyday materials figure prominently in these artists' works, such as Alex Lombard's flagpole, which is that uh, piece in the middle which is made up of a cast off umbrella and long distance calling cards by Andrea Arubla. Uh, and, and some of the art other artists who present uh, artworks which are laden with their prior use value and in this sense, their minimal forms express social and political narratives which adhere to their abstract presentation like duck to a shoe. <clears throat> As plainly quotidian, but in a more technological sense is the installation uh, by Hassan Alahi, named Concordance V7, 2015. This is a, a video installation in which uh, Hassan took photos in and around the space of the campus and represented them in a slideshow of stills. 
So what you're looking at is like a window. So when you look at the window, what you're seeing is actually this. So it's kind of a, a representation of a very kind of a generic uh, situation. <clears throat> uh, Elahi is an artist known for his practice of obsessive, obsessive digital documentation of his daily experience. In his way, entering global surveillance culture with a more localized version of self surveillance. A lot of Allahi's practice was developed out of uh, his experience of being uh, pegged post 9 11 as uh, a potential terrorist because of the way, because of his name and because of the way he looked. So he would often get pulled off of uh, plain waiting lists and interrogated to the extent that he had his own FBI agent like assigned to him. And what he did was he, uh, he said, well, you know, you want to document my whereabouts? I'll document it for you. So like he developed his whole artistic practice of this obsessive self-documentation. So he documents all his meals, documents like the, you know, the bathrooms that he takes the shit in and, you know, uh, whatever generic airport he's in at the time. So he kind of he kind of detoured the whole process of surveillance into this practice that you know he continues to um, to elaborate to this day. So he, he has he's perfect for this show because his whole practice is completely generic in the sense that he's trying to map the world or create a map that would cover the world that exactly uh, you know is exactly that world. Which is, of course, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a quixotic kind of like thing, but um, so it's humorous, but at the same time, it has this kind of like very sinister uh, uh, genesis. <clears throat> so, who is actually looking? Uh, who actually owns the basic experience of looking out or at? Is a question which Allahi leaves ultimately undecided. In doing so, his technologically based work complements the analog, perhaps humbler materials than the other works in the show, with a kind of virtual humility, which raises the question of the ultimate material connotations of the underdetermined and generic aesthetics. So I included his work in the show because it was not material, and, and I didn't want, I didn't necessarily want the discussion to just go towards materiality as the opposition to the virtual. And that the generic can actually be experienced in a virtual sense as well. So this is why I wanted to include Hassan's, um, he's much more, he's by far the most virtual artist in, in the exhibition. So here are some exhibition shots. This is, uh, this is, uh, this is a Joe Five piece, uh, it's untitled at the foreground, and that's a Joe Five piece that we looked at before. That's a Joe Five piece on the right, and that's, uh, an, uh, Matthew Schrader piece. So here you can see Hassan's, part of Hassan's installation, a Kari Yamaoka piece, uh, Ivan Balin, who's, who does the castings. And back there is a, another Matthew Schrader piece. This is an Aaron Gemmel, the scatter piece on the floor. So you can see kind of how the, the pieces interact in the, in the kind of uh, the context of the gallery. Uh, is the, the Doug Ashfords, the Kari Yamaoka, uh, Jacob Kasey, and the uh, Aaron Gemmel scatter piece. And on the end are the two uh, Matthew Schrader gasket pieces. <clears throat> this is another shot of the installation, including some of the Sari archive artists. And a larger shot of the gallery with Gemmel Kasey uh, Joe Fife and some of these sorry archive artists in the back there. And this is pretty much the whole array of the sorry archive artists, which included about four four different artists. And that was it. That was the show. So um, in in summation, uh, perhaps the generic impulse cannot be reduced to mere materiality, but can be perceived in a potential toward an empirically transcendent awareness. Of course, the empirically transcendent is something that I, I caught from Laura Well. But I think it's, it's very important uh, when talking about this particular show, um, 
So when I, when I talk about the empirically transcendent awareness, uh, it's an active sense of how contemporary mediated images and their representations are the stuff that dreams are virtually grasped from rather than actually made of. So it's not a simulacra. It's, it's, it's the idea that if, if one proceeds from the empirically transcendent, one is actively grasping back these things from the virtual. And in that sense, uh, being a, an engaged or emancipated spectator, uh, using uh, Ranciere's term. The artist in plain sight all seem implicitly aware of the struggle to retain aesthetic grace and beauty in a world of recursive and sometimes nightmarishly dead-end representations of contemporary experience, yet not to any dogmatic extent. The best response to an overdetermined imaginary might be an underdetermined aesthetic pragmatics that nevertheless takes into full account the illusion that has become our contemporary real. So I end on that note because I don't necessarily think it's a Luddite response. You know, it's the minimally determined is not necessarily a Luddite response. It's it's a eyes wide open response to a hypermediated culture. Uh, so in a, in, a, in, a, in a one sense, the, you know, the underdetermined of the generic operation is a way to uh, fully, more fully investigate what's actually going on in uh, a hypermediated hyper culture and to be more of an emancipated spectator in that context. So I'm not, I don't necessarily want to set up another dialectical opposition here. Uh, what I'm more interested in is, is, how, is using uh, Larowell's and, to some extent, Sellers' terms in a, as an interpretive foil to uh, a contemporary over-mediated uh, experience. So that was the idea behind the show. So if you get a chance to, to see the show, uh, it'd be great. Uh, it's, it's more interesting in person. <laughs> because one has to, you know, your body has to kind of interact with these things. and. And the space is kind of like, the space has so much volume that it's almost like you're wandering around in this desert and it's kind of like these kind of like these water holes of like, you know, uh, underdetermined uh, form. <laughs> did, you, did you include photography as well? No, uh, well, uh, Hassan's pieces oh. are actually photography. Is it? Yeah. But she actually seems to be employing that same perspective that you've been interested in. Is that yeah. It's the flattening of, of, I can't remember the term. Uh, I was calling it micro, micro area. Um, right. So, but it's like the third eye. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kind of like how aerial photography can turn something into like a, like an abstract image of like crops and how that becomes like, Sir Berdinsky or whatever his name is. Berdinsky, yeah. yeah right. uh, like he that. just had a show at the, at the Grand not long ago. Did he really? Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, it was, there are these gigantic prints. Yeah, the aerial is interesting because, like, when you think about early, you know, the early avant-garde photography, like, you know, all those Russians, they, they were really obsessed with the aerial image, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, Lizitsky and Rachenko, they all had portfolios full of aerial images. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they climbed to the top of the, you know, tallest building or something and take a shot. Right. But you know, but also the advent of, of, of you know uh, air travel. It's interesting how now drone photography, the proliferation of that, and the democratization of that whole technology is yeah. is allowing for that to be more accessible and almost uh, kind of revitalizing that technique in a way. Yeah, and it's but yeah, it's like it's like cartography, you know. So. This kind of quixotic, uh, you know, obsession or, or a quixotic kind of practice of Hassan's is actually making a map literally of the world with all of the photographs. Like, you know, like, so like ideally, potentially, even though this is not his intent at all, you know, if you put all the photographs together in a, in a collage, you would actually map the world. So it becomes kind of like a, becomes kind of like a, A Borges, a Borgesian kind of like uh, uh, idea mm -hmm. of like the map becomes the world. Right. You know? 
story is so complex. <laughs> so I started just down there. Is that a song? I was guilty. Well, well, but you know, it's a great, it's a great example of detournement too. It's it's brilliant because like he he got to the point where like you know he would he would be able to relate it better. But he got to a point where his his agent who was assigned to him like didn't want to hear from him anymore because he would like literally tell him every minute like and he was like don't call me like don't send me any more images because so he completely he did this detournement, you know. And one of the other investigations that I, you know, the paper that I gave at um, recently at the new at, at the new school was about genre itself, like genre itself as a, a as a container. And I used the example of um, the Rastafarians deterring the King James Bible and like completely, you know, completely taking the rhetorical power of the historical rhetorical power of that, you know, genre, and like turning it into completely something completely different, but nevertheless retaining the the expressive power of the King James Bible, but with completely different intent. So to some degree, that's what Hassan Allahi is doing. It's 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 just brilliant, you know. And the interesting thing about Hassan is also kind of he's he's also grafted it onto his own kind of like temperament because he's kind of like a he's kind of like a uh you know kind of like a laconic kind of guy you know he's he's interesting and everything but he's he's also interested in his kind of like boring situations you know so he's taking his temperament towards the generic or, or the, the quotidian boring and kind of sent it back in this kind of biofeedback loop towards the people who are looking for something really interesting so it's like kind of trying to like find a drop of water in the ocean, you know. I think it's just, it's brilliant. I, I love his practice. I think it's, yeah. if there's if there's anybody who I envy his practice, it's him. Just like, yeah. He he teaches at Micah uh, in in not at Micah. He teaches at the University of Maryland, uh, and basically his 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 charge is just to keep on traveling. He's the most peripatetic person I've ever met. Like he's. If you if you if you if you friend him on Facebook, he's like he's like literally in a different state or country every week. Like I don't know how he does it. I would have like a, literally have a nervous breakdown. Uh, you should friend him on Facebook because it's part of his practice. It's just fascinating. It's all boring images of like uh, which which one was this? Hassan. Hassan. Yeah. I know Hassan. I met Hassan personally, like before this actually happened, when he was teaching at Rutgers, because I was teaching at Mason Gross. When he was teaching at Mason Gross, and then 9/11 happened. And then, what it, was his practice like before? His practice, I don't know. I <laughs> should. That's what I've read about. It's all, all of his practice since this happened. To him. I think. I think. His practice, I don't really know. I mean, that's a good question. I really don't know what his practice was like before, you know? Uh, I met him around 2002 at Rutgers. So he was already kind of like in that realm. And, uh, but I don't know what his, I don't know what his charge is at the University of Maryland, but he seems to just be traveling. So I think that's his job is just to travel. <laughs> But you know, a lot of these artists are, are very interesting. Uh, Doug Ashford, I've known for many years, and uh, uh, still doing some really interesting work in, in both the realm of socially engaged practice and re uh, investigating abstraction, which is something that I'm interested in, uh, not in a reductive sense, like I, I've been saying over and over again, but like you know, uh, as a sense, as, as a real sense of uh, an onto ontological uh, lever that you can actually, a way of being in the world that you can actually uh, pragmatically implement. Hassan Alahi? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm yeah, I mean, it depends, you know, it's like the algorithm, it depends on how, you know, 
you might not see as many of his images as I do. Because, you know, but he's, he seems to liter literally be, and it's no exaggeration, he seems to literally be in a different state or country every, every other week. It's like amazing. Yeah? Oh, Chris, I thank you for taking your time to really explain this. But I want to explore the Sure. Is there, um, could you please explain, I guess, a bit more about what you mean by undetermined form, Okay. Uh, in a very in a very simple way, um, an overdetermined situation, say like what we're what we're dealing with now, with like a, kind of a saturation of imagery. The, the visual culture that we're dealing with now is it's kind of a mile wide and an inch deep it doesn't really have kind of a substantial uh does, that doesn't necessarily have a kind of sub substantial uh quality to it and because of that it creates a, an environment of pure representation i mean if you think of you know, all of our, our image culture is kind of making up a collage that's actually uh, forming a, a screen that you have to actually kind of like, that, that prevents you from kind of like interacting with reality. Uh, so when I say overdetermined, really what I'm talking about is, is culture, uh, you know, that's augmented by the computer, uh, social, social media, um, Hyper representation. Uh, so you know, if before you know if the early twentieth century, they're dealing with like the advent of offset lithography or something like that. But, you know, moving from lith you know like a litho plate or um, intaglio printing into you know mass produced printing. That you know, that was the advent of kind of like a plethora of image culture, which to some extent the the cubists were kind of dealing with in a in a kind of a luddite reaction in their reinvestigation of uh, so-called primitive culture, trying to do kind of like a Nietzschean kind of re, re uh, enchantment of visual culture because the visual culture at large was kind of the world is too much with me now. So, so now, I mean, it's even more of the case. I think now it's so augmented by, you know, computer generated imagery <clears throat> that, you know, if you, if you, if you go to any downtown, you look at the buses, they have, they have these big wrapped like images that, that are computer generated that's possible because of the technology. So it becomes kind of like a situation, like a dystopic situation, like in, uh, in, in Blade Runner, like where everybody's walking around, or, or yeah, any other you know sci-fi uh, novel where everybody's constantly being kind of like uh, harassed by the imagery, and this is where uh, Ranciere comes in, in in handy because his concept of the emancipated spectator is somebody who's engaging with spectatorial representations in an active way. So when I use the term overdetermined, really what I'm talking about in the media and over media, over mediated culture is that that's what I'm talking about, like the plethora of images that we're kind of dealing with all the time, and that their representations, uh, they're not necessarily benign representations. Most of the representations are based on you know capitalist marketing, uh, you know brand implementation, the self shaping, you know, to the extent that we become you know. Facebook profiles, uh, fairly shallow representations of uh, social constructs, demographics. Uh, so the idea, the idea be behind uh, reinvestigating minimal form and minimally determined things is kind of like to move away from thinking about the surface tension of all those representations and thinking about 
you know, where is the personal punctum in all that? Like, where is it? Where is a place where you can kind of like either have a handle or a grasp or or puncture through the the screen of representations where you can actually have a an actionable phenomenal um, effect on your on your world. And it's not just like literally like like picking up a shovel and like digging a ditch, but it, it, metaphorically it has an effect in terms of how how politically active you are. It's not necessarily just like clicking on a link, you know, or, or clicking on a uh, um, whatever you know whatever you know political or social. Uh, Whatever you know, I mean, like, you, like you see, like, you know, is that really activism? Probably not. You know, uh, it's more passivism. You know, um, and you know, there was somebody who, uh, like Olivia, who presented that uh, wonderful uh, presentation at uh, Eflux a couple couple of weeks ago. Somebody who works in the museum culture, twenty five years old interesting ideas of not interactivity but interpassivity so she is also i, I was interested in, in olivia's presentation because she is 25 and she also has kind of like kind of like fed up kind of fed up with image culture as just sheer representation and in her presentation she talked about the imperative to interact in a museum context with contemporary art, that wasn't really an interaction. It was a, a mediated interaction. So interactivity is not really interactivity, it's mediated. So there are all these levels, there are all these Kafkaesque levels of mediation, uh, whereas you know, interactivity will be presented as you know, uh, connectivity, but it's actually atomization of, so, of the social. Does that answer your question? No, that's great. Thank okay. You. Um, if I might uh, add add something that might perhaps like add a little bit of clarification, maybe for her question, but sure. then also uh, add something that might interest you if you're not aware of it. Um, within uh, youth culture today, there's there's a, a term that's being thrown around quite a bit called normcore. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's yep. sort of this. <laughs> yeah, and it's totally an aesthetic, it's generic, I think. Yeah, right. I mean, so um, if you're not familiar with it, it's it's uh, which are you? Okay. Um, so it's it's like a withdrawal from from fashion in a way that is like Tom said, a non-dialectical way, like non-reacting against it. But it's like um, it's like going back. It's it's. Kind of like this genesis of like hardcore which is like transgressive and like normal which is like i guess non-transgressive so um like going like for an, an example of like normcore style would be like dressing like someone like from the show of science so, you know what i mean so <laughs> um it, it's like it's like a non-fashion i guess you, you could I, say I'm, I, like chinos it's a it's a unisex style I we're talking I, like I mean, I jeans and like... Okay. okay okay i see why okay so I, I i pulled it up on wikipedia normcore is a unisex fashion trend characterized by unpretentious average looking clothing it's um, a portmanteau of the words normal and hardcore um okay <laughs> I just I thought it might add because I mean it's a reaction against like sort of these not, not against but it's kind of like transcendental empiricist right. uh, transcendental empiricist fashion I mean, in I which like the transcendental would be like the like transgressive in a way yeah but the empiricist is more like like generic photography like 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 just paying attention to the generic and like almost like pushing through the generic to something else that is right. that's beyond it so it it people who do, do not wish to distinguish themselves from others by their clothing it's not it does not mean that they are unfashionable people who wear whatever comes to hand but they are conscious 
they consciously choose clothes that are undistinguished except frequently for highly visible labor to impart prestige. Um, Using a highly visible label that's the one that it works abstract. It's sort of like like how trucker hats and mustaches and stuff like that were kind of cool and put zero zeros. Well, they're also appropriated in a kind of a mag way with by gay culture. Yeah. You know, like like they were torn. Yeah. You know, like the masculine masculine things. But it's also, you know, what you know what's really appropriate here is a Gambon's interpretation of uh, Bartleby. So, you know, the whole idea of preferring not to is an activist thing. It's not it's not a, a passive thing. So like Olivia's presentation of interpassivity was an activist thing. It wasn't retreat. Right. So the, the idea in of preferring not to is not necessarily like a Luddite reaction, but it's actually, it opens the world to possibility. Uh, you know, that's that's his interpretation of it. So, to some, to some degree, like the generic can, you know, like it's used in a colloquial way to refer to the banal, you know, and it does have a relationship to the everyday, but I think of the banal as kind of like a pejorative term. You know, and you know, know. has a term called uh, that I used in my dissertation a little bit. He didn't go too far into it, but he called it the, the everyday sublime, mm -hmm. which I think kind of captures something that was called that. Yeah, though so I, 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 I would tend to avoid the word sublime too, just because it's problematic. Or, or Benny means uh, appropriate. Yeah, but you know, like the profane is also like it's just such a charged word. It's so overdetermined now, <laughs> and so is the sublime in a funny way. It's like this. You know, it's like we're Kant, my point, couldn't figure it stuff out. Or something. <laughs> it's like he invented the sublime. Or, you know. So, so you think the word generic is better than profane in the sense that it's that it's not it's not an argument. Well, profane literally means outside of the temple, really. Right. Yeah, that's, so that's part of what is generic. Right, but it's not the special place. It's right, but profane, since it's, it, it means like outside the temple, it's kind of, it sets up this dialect, dialectical, like, you know, agonism. And so like, I don't like, the, I don't like banal because it sets up, you know, the ideal versus the banal or beauty versus like ugliness, like right. the high and the low. Right. And the whole the whole thing that's so liberating about, you know, if you interpret Meyer well this way, is like that all of those oppositions they just get suspended, and it's not even an issue. But isn't that isn't that what conjoining those two terms is supposed to do? Propane, propane and illumination is supposed to explode. Yeah, well, yes, yeah, so it's very similar to the empirically transcendent. Right. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. This, but this idea, but the idea of the generic. Is almost repurposing the term generic to mean something more without even needing a qualifier. Yes. Yeah. Can I ask you guys a question? You guys may be able to both answer it for me, but like, I remember, do you remember when I was first sort of reading about speculative realism and I, I brought up pragmatism mm -hmm. and I felt like there were certain resonances, but I'm wondering if. You guys could help me articulate kind of what are the resident resonances between like seller authority and like the realm. You know, that's the I'm not sure what it is. Particular resonances between the like speculative, speculative realism. <clears throat> and oh, I'm not sure what it is. Like, I guess thinkers like. Yeah, well, I think I think it's you know I think the tradition in continental thought is just to get rid of representations. Mm -hmm. You know, the representational thinking. I think the similar pragmatic in the American pragmatism. Mm -hmm. You know, but there's also I'm looking at it as arbitrary but still useful. What's weird for me about about speculative realism is it almost is like Emersonian transcendent 
transcendentalist, you know, like right. on a certain level. That's why Shapiro is really calling a lot upon like Whitehead and stuff. Yeah. Which is, is I, I still kind of think of Whitehead as sort of that kind of Emersonian, like transcendentalist. Yeah, well, what, what is like the fallacy of fallacy of discrete location or something like that? It's like, it's, yeah, it's kind of like, uh, you know, I remember I went to, uh, went to a conference on the revival of pragmatism in 1996 or something like yeah. that. And Brody was the key speaker. Mm -hmm. But there are other people, and I remember, I forget who said it, who said, you know, on the, on the road, on the pragmatist road, it's like a, it's a long highway, there's no rest stops. So I, I think the kind of hard to pin down aspect of speculative realism as relates to pragmatism because it doesn't come up with a decisional, there's no decisional threshold. Right. Uh, I think that Rorty tries to combine, you know, the history of pragmatism with liberalism, like American liberalism. And I think that's where, you know, his particular thing, he, he's trying to, Derived an ethic from it. Whereas a lot of the speculative realists, like Brassier and people like that, are, are like biased. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I, I get the, the major grip. Yeah. And, yeah. But I think I think the best I think the best reading or the best use of uh, like American pragmatism is is to suspend the decisional threshold, but to not be nihilistic. And it's not necessarily a positivism either. It's kind of right. like a realism. It's right. like a form of realism. Yeah, and I guess that's the sense that I feel like they're related. In some form. I don't know if speculative real speculative realism is realism. To me, it's more like transcendentalism. It, it, it seems more metaphysics. To me. Yeah, it seems it's kind like, of wacky and metaphysics. Although, although there's all sorts of temperatures of, of speculative realism. It's not right. Like like object oriented ontology is kind of wacky. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've read stuff by by Steve Shavaro. It's like brilliant. Yeah, I, and I, I like I, I feel like he like, kind of positions himself a little bit at odds with. I mean, at odds with with the like and, yeah. um, and well, although he is so he, he's so delusion about it that he's not gonna, he's not the kind of it's kind of like saying he's um, not dialectic. Yeah, like how how, would, how do you oppose Hegel without proving Hegel correct? You know, <laughs> right. you, without explaining, you, you don't you don't oppose Hegel. Right. You like withdraw from the kind yeah. of the, the, yeah. The, 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 and right. so I think that's kind of what he's doing with speculative realism. He's he is almost like pushing through part of it in order to um, create something else that is still kind of more. I mean, I think it's a little bit more Deleuzean. Yeah, for uh, sure. The way he uses white and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think that he. Well, um, it's, a, it's non anthropocentric. Yeah. It's non, it's, I don't know. I think of it as like ontological on um, equality more than like a. You know, it becomes a little, it becomes a little tricky though because. You know, when you think of like anthropo like the the move away from anthropo anthropocentric centrism, like you know what the intent is, is to kind of get out of that representational thinking or you know, like conceit of mm -hmm. representation, like representational conceits. Mm -hmm. But there's also an abstraction to that. Right. You know, there's an abstraction to moving away from anthropocentric thinking. So it's it's a it's a funny thing. It's like it's not the jury is out, you know. Right. And with With someone like Melissa, like I, I I find him the least believable of any of those people because he seems to be really trying to create a superstructure. Uh, and I, I kind of find it kind of fallacious. That's just my own opinion. Yeah. But it's it's weird. I find myself more interested in Melissa than Robert Rollins. Oh really? Yeah. Which which is weird. Because Barwell is, seems like to be much more of a natural match to the existentialist, which is like my primary mm -hmm. figure that I worked with other than her. But, um, but I really like, I, I really enjoy everything I've ever read about Melissa personally. Well, I think I he's a good writer. Yeah. 
Well, it's but, just the but I didn't, I didn't like Adam's yeah. attitude that much. Like, I just felt like it was kind of like him trying to kind of carve out a certain rationalization for like people to agree with it. Well, the it seemed that I, like him being ambitious and trying to carve out, like, trying to corner the market or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, yeah. 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 But the thing that I, I just, the, the science fiction nerd in me likes, like, I like the part where he's thinking about time existing outside of any perceiving body, right. which, which is totally at odds with the like, kind of nominological critique of temporality that, that, I, that I was exposed to in my MA. Um, and just you know, saying, no, we actually can use you know, uh, current scientific devices that can, that can carbon date and tell us a lot about, about time and, and you know, that going well, well beyond human, not just human experience, but like human existence. And that to me is, you know, I don't like this idea that time is socially constructed. Uh, I don't think it's wrong to be socially constructed. I think time, time as we engage with it is socially constructed, yes. but that's not nature. Right. Yeah. yeah, and so I'm not sure if I, you know, I would have to read after kind of too closer, but just the feeling that it left me on the first read, seemed really challenging and exciting, personally. Anyway, I kind of sidetracked us, and now I have to go. No, it's okay. Yeah, it's nice it's, it's, yeah absolutely. absolutely. You know, I appreciate it, yeah. yeah. So we should continue the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, what, what's, your, what's, your, what's your background? Are you an artist, or? She's starting something like, kind of like hyper Oh really? Yeah. A critical? Um, um, I mean that's the goal. Yeah. I'm a writer. I write criticism. I write art criticism. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's actually one of the main goals, but it is just kind of having a platform for artists. One artist exposure, I guess I you know, two is to be critical and have the artists such like it exists such that the artists become more self critical in the art city here. Right. New York. Okay, so um, I'm very motivated by my friends in Detroit who have had to the best with them. Yeah. And not only are they, you know, doing it to stay unique, or you know, you're speaking that earlier, it's like you know, unique or not, is that to survive there, but yet they're staying, you know, like you said, like they're staying there, and putting and representing Detroit. So it's right. like bringing the attention back to something that people a lot potentially can do. I felt, I feel that that can exist within the reference within our own as we exist already. Mm -hmm. um, so bringing that idea to other people who are interested right. in the arts as well. Right. And, um, that's, that's one of my main goals. I'm, I'd like to have that's them great. ask them for social work and I want to go into neuropsychology. Wow. Arts are also important. Sure. Who are you writing for? Ourselves. We're called Couture Tape Operative. So we have a Couture Tape, um, but this is someone else's uh, past project that you've seen in the news recently. That's interesting that you're not coming from the art. Yeah. yeah, really nice to meet you. Yeah. yeah. So we'll follow up. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. I'll edge on Facebook or something. Okay. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, thanks for your Yeah, sure. Nice to meet you, too, Michael. Take it easy. Um, well, I've always been an artist, but I grew up with a preserved tone. It's all in Right. Right, So, um, I'm very analytical in thinking, but I've always been a creative person. That's why I right. gravitate towards what. And, and until last year, I was fighting that, but then I was like, well, what's a way I can segue, how can I segue into both and, and somehow make a living eventually, I guess, like, it's my free time, but. Well, one of the great things about, like, say, the New Center, right, is that they're really, in, you know, one of the reasons why I appreciate my affiliation with it is, like, the, the categorical distinctions are very fluid and very kind of, like, uh, not necessarily discipline bound. Like 
there seems to be a kind of an openness to kind of including, so like Olivia, you know, like working in a museum, being an artist, like those roles aren't necessarily bound, you know, so like, it's really the thinking, I, I think that it's really the thinking that interests me, and, and that, that can, you know, so like if you, I, I think if you establish something that has a high level of inquiry in Grand Rapids, it will have traction. You know, and, and it might have traction outside of Grand Rapids too. Yeah, the criticism is necessary in all media. I mean, there is no true criticism in media, especially in Grand Rapids. Right. Uh, it's necessary for any artist to expand the art of what they do, to right. be able to have somebody put into words what they're doing. I mean, as a working artist, you're, you're basically have to create your own theory wall yeah. as opposed to is that because um, there's less critics? There's just less critics, there's less people that write, you know, yeah. assist you in writing. I mean, you, you, as an artist, I'm, it's dependent upon myself to come up with my own, I mean, to do, not just do my work, but also to write about myself. Right. You know, as opposed to have somebody view me from the outside who has a better understanding of what I'm doing from a historical. You know, yeah, I mean, and there's a tradition for that, like, you know, like Donald Judd, Robert Smithson, like all wrote about their own work to create a context in which nobody else understood, mm -hmm. you know. So, so the other thing is like, you know, like when I was developing the, my own kind of like curator, uh, critical criteria, a lot of it came from like my relationship to place. Like I identified with Robert Smith I identified with William Carlos Williams and his kind of quotidian, very simple poetry. He happened to be uh, Smithson's doctor. He delivered him, you know. So the sense of place was really important. And I think, like for instance, like Sellers coming from Ann Arbor, right, and being one of the kind of like, you know, you know being important in the pragmat American pragmatist philosophy is important like that's important uh the whole school of chicago and and, and dewey uh i mean um, experiential knowledge not necessarily a priori uh, idealistic knowledge so i mean i think to some extent the position of michigan or chicago in the midwest has its, uh, its own kind of ontological tradition and a lot of it's based in pragmatism you know and I think what's happening in, in Detroit is interesting because it's, there's this kind of like, this kind of like grassroots, homegrown kind of like a utopic kind of thing kind of growing there in the ruins, right? But, you know, someone could also interpret that as kind of a prag pragmatic, you know, movement or non-idealistic non non idea of like, you, like a utopian. Like how do you re how do you recalibrate the idea of utopian without being like foolishly idealistic? You know? no. That's why that's why like then what what are its uh, uh, kind of reinvestigation of idealism is interesting because it's like like how do you reposition those things that <laughs> might power like a utopian uh, vision without like you know being being foolishly utopian? Which is, I think it's a lot of those issues that people in Detroit are struggling with, right? Sorry, I wasn't. Well, you know, like, I well, how, how, you know, how, how, it's, it's the same old struggle. It's like when you're an artist, how do you, how do you not become the spirit of identification? Maintain, you know, maintain your kind of uh, autonomy within like a changing situation. Right, right. <clears throat> But it is important to kind of create a criticality, you know, uh, to kind of frame it. I mean, it's exciting to try to frame that. I know? think that it exists already, you know, no matter what, but having someone, like you said, to be outside of it, like I am, like I was trained to play violin, so like I was born, I like, have the terms of music and like integrating that knowledge with like content. So that's my, you know, but a lot of people I work with are like, artists on their own and I have faced this kind of 
struggle with kind of delineating what my ideas are and like bringing it to interpretation because the artists themselves have their own, like you said, you know, you the worst in it. And what are you going to be doing? And, <laughs> and so I was like, because you're never going to be satisfied like, with what you're doing. You at must point. realize I'm not an artist, and you know, speaking, and it's like I understand the artistic process. That's why I'm not an artist. Like, you know, like I, I'm the one about social work, and like I was like that as kind of a frame, but like, you know, in, in my sense, like trying to apply some of these concepts or like ideas. Pragmatically, with art is like where I'm, I'm feeling this like big wall, great wall, and I, I don't you know it's it's very one step at a time. So I appreciate you sharing that. It was, I mean, I started in my twenties in, in in Michigan, living in Michigan. It's just weird. It's grown leaps and bounds in West Michigan. find yourself going down this rabbit hole as you read more and more philosophy and criticism of your theory, um, you get to a point where why am I doing, you know, why am I doing this? You know, because you're not having, you know, a conversation like we're having now and you need to be able to talk to. So it just kind of came to a point where I like ebbed off and then like 20 years later I stepped back into it and started working on it. You know, sort of reestablishing myself and like creating a practice where like I work in my work is primarily in wax. So when I create a work after the work has been shown and it's been documented, I can then transform all of that work into something else just by right. melting it down. So it's a Which is kind of like a pragmatic solution. Yeah. So I'm not. I don't feel like I'm putting something. Necessarily physical into the world. I mean, I, don't, I, mean, I do sell you know, editions of what I do, but as far as storing work for myself, I don't, I don't have to worry about that sort of a situation because I'm constantly renewing what I'm, what I'm doing and putting. On top of having that previous work and that work involved in it, put it into, into new work, new ideas, new stories. You're constantly in it's a constant learning process. You're going to be doing it, especially if you choose any form of artwork. You're constantly doing it all the time. And also, like you know, in most higher ed educational institutions, the there's an imperative towards inter interdisciplinary learning. So you're just doing, it, you know, and, yeah. and and also I'd like to say like. You have to be careful about who you're talking to because a lot of artists are laboring under their own representations. Like they're also, they're, they're you know, they're limited in how they're in, in their consciousness. They might not be visionary in, uh, in their consciousness. That's exactly what I was speaking to. Yeah. And, um, and then I did actually go to myself like, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing this? I know why, but with the feedback from artists, um, you know, there was that like pushback, the putting negative feedback onto me, saying, you know, me as an individual. I I don't know, like, I guess I came across like trying to capitalize on me or something, oh. I, or something. I'm not sure, but I came across. There's a lot of artists who hate critics too. And, and, but that's, it's, well, I mean, I wish they were critics. You know, that's, that's oh, why I, 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 like, I, like, I like artists who like critics. Tell me how to do it. No, I like the artists who like critics. Yeah, there's a lot of artists who are just like, well, just, I don't want to hear about it. You know? Yeah. 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 They, Which is, it's totally valid. But the thing is, if, for me, like, if you're trying to engender community, Right. If you're inter if you're trying to engender like communication and interdisciplinary uh, discussion and stuff like that, and someone says, "Well, you know, you're just trying to capitalize on me," that's their problem. You know? totally. They're like they're just a narcissistic. What are they, that was just something that I thought that maybe that's a big I came across the sense, but um, well, some some people aren't like narcissists. If, if 
before they become artists? You kind of have to be. Yeah, but, but no, no, but the thing is, you have to be a really good narcissist. Yeah. You know, to the extent that you're a really good narcissist. But if, if you're insecure about your narcissism, then you don't listen to anybody. You know, it's a weird but thing. It's like if, yeah. when you're a narcissist, you don't listen to anybody. But if you're insecure about your narcissism, you really don't listen to anybody. But from my point of view, it's like I think that 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 really exists as there's that the first lot, and so if there's siloing of the art community and a lot of the artists siloing. Yeah, 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 um, no, it's a good so, term. What, what, what uh, was this one? Silo? Silo. It's perfect for the Midwest. Silo. Um, it's kind of like what happens in neoliberal, you know, yeah. culture. I thought you said silo. Like, like, yeah, yeah, neoliberal so, oh, culture does not create a lot of good work. No, it doesn't. It's a silo software. Like a hard silo. Yeah, yeah, no, that is a good term. Sometimes that she's positively. I've heard it used positively. Like from by entrepreneurs. I've heard that term used positively. No, they they would use it in, in terms of like specialization. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean that's yeah. But I know that's not what you said. Going back to the art and community in the Wolf Carter office, I don't know um about like the Midwest, but there is that, and it's like, um, what is it? There's a moment um, from artists on the other side, and but, you know, like, um, it's been almost a year, like, of talking to them, finally having a website, having a name, having people in charge, or someone to like, four different disciplines, I guess I would say. That's great. Is that, that breaking that barrier, though, is what. Are the artists that I, that it's just, I don't really have to put it into words because I don't know where it comes from. You said like their own consciousness, like they, you know, I have to, I have to learn how to navigate with artists. Yeah. Because I am, and, and you know, and it's like trying to read them and know them. And so I don't, I can't bring up the like as a kind of point person, right, right. Yeah, well, it's, it's like the it's like the the you know, proverbial herding cats, you know. Like you know, it's you're not going to be you're never going to be successful. With that, you know. It's been a thing for grand Rapids and change in People that come, part of the group, they and that's what the away. point of what it, the idea is is like the artist collective. So the artists want it to be something that they come and go, but for me, I am saying like you want to make something more stable and yeah. realizing that, like what you said, like their philosophy or their consciousness is so maybe not necessarily carved out to be able to. Like, to Beat me, I right. guess, as for the critic, the, the critical awareness that I'm so used to, like, applying analytically outside of art. Like, you know, if that's the profession, that's what they come to do. Right. But, you know, somebody last night when I was presenting this at uh, Western Michigan University was asking me about politics, you know, like how, how, um, how one should be politically engaged, right, in, in art. And this is kind of relevant to what you're saying. And I said, well, even though I'm working in an abstract mode, I consider myself as the abstract cadre of like political intent. So, you know, if you have, you know, if you have cadres, you have specialized cadres. So, like, I, I, I actually, you know, I, I see mine as kind of like you know, not reductive form, not in terms of pure form, but. As, a, as one way to express kind of like an embodied uh, experience or a relationship that is a foil to representational culture. So you can also think of all the artists that you're involved with as different kind of like, you know, coming from different perspectives and like together, they don't also, they don't all have to act the same way, you know, in, in expressing a community. 
they can all express the community in different ways. So that, that's problematic because they have different expectations of what a community is. But I think if you're trying to be kind of like somebody who's kind of engendering community, you can't, you can't have expectations of them. Exactly. Yeah, so that's the tricky thing. That's exactly. <laughs> you just have to, you have to be large, you have to have more largesse. It'll make you a larger person. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, it's good, and that's why I really appreciate so much. Yeah, sure. It's fun. I mean, you know, when I was a young artist, when I was your age, I became involved in a literary and arts magazine. And it was great because I had an instrument to like interview people. And I did one of very, very early interview of Leon Gala, who I got to know, and so they, you know, became part of like my support structure. But when you know when we had editorial meetings, then it was just like horrible because nobody was nobody saw eye to eye. But we still got it done somehow, you know. And, is, and, and you know, collective collective work is difficult. Any kind of collective organization. It is. <laughs> and it all happened so fast because I think the art community is behind that somehow. But I'm trying to bring forth like the younger ones because there is like the Kind of, you know, you know, they put themselves out there to the point where they've enough, they've exhausted their resources. Right, right. But, and there's certain ones where I see talent, I see all of that is really, really, that's organic, really cute. Right. And that's your art. But, so that's what you can offer them. You can offer that objective, critical, yeah, and, and yeah. So, I, what I think it is also that being so and if they're not being a critical discourse within the arts community and being open, I don't think that, I think there's a fear, I think, of putting more art. We already being vulnerable to your art out there. Right. So I think yeah. that I was all to come in, like, being the four and what that. Yeah. It's so, it is. There's also this tribal thing that happens, you know, like when you're, when you're, you're in a community, like, if, Somebody expresses a, a defined opinion. It's like, oh, well, who are you? Right. That's what <laughs> it's I like. That. Yeah, it's like, oh, so you're setting yourself up as an authority here. And so yeah, I am. I'm setting it myself. And like, you can do that too. Which is exactly right. what an artist does too, right? Right. Oh, right. An artist right. is setting themselves right. up as an authority. So right. why can't we just have lots of authorities? But there's this weird tribal thing that happens where like you're not supposed to be above everybody else. Right. Like, it's, and but that's total. Bullshit representation. That's what right. I was talking about. Like you can't even be worried about that. Right. You just gotta develop a thick skin and don't worry about that. And that's know? what I'm doing. I think that we're like trying to relate to the artists now is harder because it's not friends. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's like it's, you know like your yeah, honeymoon is over. You're playing it out of planet and like actually having to like step back and do accordingly. Is hard because they're only willing so far because a lot of artists in their are jaded, at least the ones I work with, and the younger ones who are like, jaded. jaded. Like they've been burned by people who haven't oh. been able to deal with their past. And then the younger, like 18, 20 year olds, are trying, or are, are protected because of that. Like yeah. you're in it for yourself in a way. So now that's politics, but. Um, it's weird, you know, because when you're when you're young, you haven't really developed any representations. It's like you're you're in the business of generating representations that you could then discard, you know. Yeah. So it, it is harder with younger people because, like, you know, you, you're it's like don't bother me. I'm busy like trying to create my identity here, you know. So it's it's hard. It's mostly a especially in Grand Rapids. It's just a matter of getting out. And talking. I mean, yeah, finding finding it's a finding receptive kindred, arts community. Finding kindred spirits too. Yeah, it's a thick skin that's Yeah. It's a trust me, it's a highly receptive arts community. Keep at it. <laughs> well, thanks for coming. Nice to meet you. Thanks, Colleen. Yeah, good luck, Colleen. Do you have a card or something? Or? No, I do.